In the 30s of the 20th century, led by Charles Lucky Luciano, the Mafia was dominating all of America. Harlem, a massive suburb of New York and the epicenter of the African-American population of the United States, was also under the Mafia's control. Nobody would have guessed that by the end of the 30s, this district would be entirely under the control of a black person. Back then, it was impossible, like something straight out of a fairy tale. While the Italians were around, they were the undisputed kings of organized crime, but changing that was simply impossible. Nonetheless, it became the reality. Bumpy Johnson, experiencing the hatred of the white population all his life and, due to his skin color, unable to make a prominent figure in the criminal world, suddenly became the godfather of Harlem. Bumpy Johnson is now most prominently known thanks to the popular TV series Godfather of Harlem. Some of you may have even heard his name earlier in American Gangster. But how much of what is shown in popular culture is true about the man that became the first gangster kingpin who was black? Coming up, you will find out what Johnson had to go through to become the King of Harlem and how, for many years, he jockeyed to maintain his power. And at the very end of the video, we will tell you who the renowned drug lord Frank Lucas actually was to Bumpy Johnson. Ellsworth Raymond Johnson's problems started the day he was born. We by no means condone racism, but the fact of the matter is that he had the misfortune of being born black. Back when Bumpy was born, it was really tough to be black in America. In most cases, you would be doomed to a miserable existence, exposed to constant hatred, contempt, and ridicule from the white population. The government wasn't helping, passing laws that to varying degrees limited the rights of the black population. Bumpy's family lived in constant fear of racial violence. The only salvation out of the system could have been being born into money, but unfortunately, Bumpy was born into a typical poor Afro-American family. His dad was a fisherman and his mom a housewife. No money, no prospects. When Bumpy was only 10, the situation became even worse when his older brother William was accused of killing a white man in Charleston. Even if he was innocent, everyone knew full well what this meant for both him and his family. Afraid of a possible lynch mob, his parents mortgaged their tiny home to raise money to send Willie up north to live with relatives. Due to a slight deformation of his skull, Ellsworth was given the name Bumpy at a young age, and it stuck. With his brother gone, Bumpy's hatred of the whites only grew. Seeing this, the parents decided that the 13-year-old Ellsworth should also be sent north to make sure he wouldn't do anything unlawful. So, three years after William and the other kids were set up north, Bumpy Johnson followed suit. Harlem, a neighborhood in Upper Manhattan of New York City, was, in a way, the capital for the black population of America. Presently home to 50,000 African Americans, that number only grew year over year. Considering that Bumpy's older sister already lived there, the question of where to send a young gangster was irrelevant. Change isn't always for the best, but the parents thought that in Harlem, living amongst other Afro-Americans, Bumpy would have the chance to change his life for the better, receive support from others in a similar position, and possibly even obtain some form of education. But as is usually the case, it all turned out entirely not as desired. Suddenly, Bumpy discovered that he had hefty criminal abilities. Despite moving north, Johnson couldn't escape racism, and with his small physique and a strong southern accent, Bumpy became a target for bullying. Fortunately, Johnson's nasty temper kept him from becoming an unfortunate victim, and as a teenager, he became a daring scrapper who others avoided getting tangled up with. Once properly settled in Harlem, the lad gradually started ditching school and soon stopped showing up entirely. While not particularly interested in education, Bumpy was smart and quick-witted from birth. Education wasn't something that interested Bumpy, but the streets were, plentiful with ways to get some cash, which he needed. By the time he was 15, Johnson was kicking it up with a questionable crowd, working odd jobs for some side cash, and playing billiards and dice for cash. But handing out newspapers and sweeping floors of shops wasn't something that Bumpy wanted to do in the long term. Living amid African Americans, he figured out that he could kill several birds with one stone, 
he could help his community make some cash and satiate his rage that was building up all these years all at the same time. So, Bumpy started offering black shopkeepers protection. It's worth mentioning that Johnson's crew, considering their young age, did a pretty good job, despite not having a large client base. William Bub Hewlett, a gangster with tenure, was also offering similar services and was famous throughout Harlem. Sooner or later, it was inevitable that young Bumpy and Bub, who was Johnson's senior of 17 years, would meet, and it wouldn't go well for the young buck. One day, Hewlett came to a newly opened store and offered protection to its owner. In return, the owner said that he already paid for protection to a certain Bumpy Johnson. The answer shocked the gangster, and without a blink of hesitation, he decided to clip the wings of his rival. He was shocked to find out that his competitor was a 16-year-old boy. Once they were face to face, Bub demanded that Bumpy hand over all his clients and get lost while he could still walk. But Johnson's answer astonished him. Even though he was risking his life, his response was a firm no. This is where Johnson's story could have ended, but William Bub Hewlett turned out to be no mere brute, but a man of farsightedness and ambition. Bub saw the boy's potential and was impressed by his bravery, inviting him into the business of providing physical protection for high-ranking bankers of Harlem. It didn't take long for Johnson to become one of the most sought-after bodyguards in the area. With Bub Hewlett's support, Johnson's criminal career took off and jumped to a whole different level. Bumpy was considered a very dangerous man. He was feared, not only because he never left his home without a gun or a knife, but also because if the situation presented itself, he wouldn't hesitate to skillfully use them. Armed robbery, burglary, extortion, pimping, Johnson was involved in all of it now. But this could not have gone unnoticed for long. Bumpy soon got on the cops' radar, and they got to work with all due diligence. Perhaps, if he was white, he would have been able to avoid any charges, but nobody even thought of looking the other way when it came to an insolent black thug. As a result, Bumpy was celebrating his 17th birthday while doing time in Elmira Reformatory. But this was just the beginning. The next decade will see Johnson in and out of jail for a variety of crimes, including illegal possession of a weapon, grand larceny, and more. Bumpy became a famous gangster, but not so big that when he spent a decade in prison, people on the streets still remembered him. He wasn't, nor could he ever be, a part of the Italian Mafia, and for the same reason he couldn't have been a kingpin of Harlem. All he could settle for was being a proficient gangster, albeit not a very influential one. Finally, concluding his most recent unforgettable visit to prison in 1932, Bumpy came out and had the firmest intention to never go back in. Unfortunately, he had no money and no way of making it, other than once again getting involved with criminals. Though card rooms offering games like poker and blackjack were flourishing in cities across America, it was the numbers game that took over Harlem. Also known as the numbers racket or Italian lottery, it was an illegal lottery popularized in the 1920s and 30s. With bets starting at just a penny, the game was predominantly played in poor and working-class neighborhoods. While many independent bookmakers capitalized on the numbers racket, Bronx mob boss Dutch Schultz bulldozed almost every bookie into working for him. This was much better than the alternative, losing their business altogether. However, Stephanie St. Clair, one of the only female racket runners in Harlem, refused to back down. She needed strong and reliable people for her crew, and soon her gaze fell on Bumpy Johnson, a man who could become her right hand. The union was mutually beneficial. Stephanie's crew gained a reliable, quick-witted member who could be tasked with any job, and Bumpy could once again step into the spotlight under the support of a powerful and respected ally. Johnson became St. Clair's bodyguard and her main muscle. At the time, St. Clair was the reigning queen of several criminal organizations across Harlem. She was the leader of a local gang, the 40 Thieves, and was also a key investor in the numbers racket in the neighborhood. St. Clair was certain that Bumpy Johnson would be her perfect partner in crime. She was impressed by his intelligence, and the two quickly became fast friends despite their 20-year age difference, though some biographers peg her as being only 10 years his senior. Some sources claim that Bumpy started working for her back in 1924, 
but even if that was the case, Johnson wouldn't be able to accomplish many of her tasks, considering that back then he spent most of his time going in and out of prison. In any case, their work began in earnest in 1932, when St. Clair refused to work with the mob boss Dutch Schultz, thereby drawing his wrath, which was expected to be dealt with by her new colleague, Bumpy Johnson. After Prohibition was repealed, the profits of the Italian-American and Jewish criminal clans dropped, and to mitigate some of that damage, they decided to go into the gambling scene of Harlem. Dutch Schultz reigned practically over the whole of Harlem, but was unable to come to an agreement with Queenie, as Stephanie St. Clair was commonly known, thus resulting in a gang war. Despite her crew resembling a small and loyal army, Schultz never doubted his inevitably swift victory. Perhaps it would have been the case if it weren't for Bumpy. Johnson and his crew of nine waged a guerrilla war of sorts. Picking off Dutch Schultz's men was easy, since few other white men were walking around Harlem during the day. Despite all their efforts, it wasn't enough. Schultz's army was massive, and his connections stretched far and wide, and Harlem almost entirely belonged to him. Dutchmen regularly attacked Queenie's crew, shot up her gambling dens, and at every turn put rods into the figurative wheels of her business. At one point, they even bribed one of St. Clair's friends to lure her into an apartment that was ambushed, but luckily her friend didn't give her up and told Queenie about the upcoming assassination attempt. Interestingly, one of the crucial muscles of Dutch Schultz's crew was William Bub Hewlett, the very same guy who noticed young Bumpy and advanced his criminal career. Previous partners have now become bitter enemies. Bub didn't wage war for too long. However, as soon as it started, he was sent to prison. As personally unfortunate as that was for him, his send-off didn't affect the war effort in the slightest, with lots of blood continuing to be spilled and many people continuing to die. Bumpy realized that they couldn't be victorious in the open field, so he took a radical step and contacted the, perhaps, leading mafioso of the time, Lucky Luciano. It was a challenge to get on the Italian's good side, but Bumpy's erudition and education did the trick. Lucky was impressed and surprised by the depth of knowledge coming from a black-skinned thug. Nonetheless, Luciano refused Johnson's call for aid, as he was still Schultz's business partner. The situation was untenable. Dutch was pressing harder, and the resources to deal with him were running out. Thankfully for Queenie and Bumpy, Schultz would soon commit a mistake that would prove fatal for him. At the start of the 30s, U.S. Attorney Thomas Dewey set his sights on convincing Schultz for federal tax evasion. Schultz was indicted in New York in January of 1933, and by not showing up, became a fugitive. After a while, Schultz was acquitted, but Dewey was not going to let the gangster walk that easy and pressed harder. Therefore, Dutch decided to kill him and asked permission from the commission, the governing body of the Italian-American mafia. The commission voted unanimously against the proposal. Enraged, Schultz said he was going to kill Dewey anyway and walked out of the meeting. An act this brazen could have easily provoked a massive response from the law enforcement bodies. So Lucky Luciano, along with other bosses, decided to get rid of Schultz. The official version claims that Dutch Schultz was shot in the bathroom by two gangsters from the renowned Murder, Inc., and Schultz died the next day in the hospital. There is also another version, however, that claims that Lucky Luciano gave permission to remove Schultz to Bumpy Johnson personally. Interestingly, the same Thomas Dewey who was saved from assassination by Lucky Luciano's vote would a year later get to work on Luciano and ensure that he would spend a good deal of time behind bars. After Schultz's murder, the three-year-old gang war that saw the streets run red from the blood of dozens of people who died finally ended. St. Clair, although not involved in the hit, sent Schultz an infamous telegram while he was on his deathbed in the hospital that said, As ye sow, so shall ye reap. Bumpy and Queenie now had no enemies but they were still heavily dependent on the Italian Mafia. After Schultz's death, the route to the negotiation table was open, but to have a black person approach the Cosa Nostra and attempt to do business with them still seemed ludicrous, despite Luciano's and Johnson's warm conversation a year prior. But Bumpy was determined and smart. He firmly decided he would get his deal. In the end, Luciano took over most of Schultz's numbers operations in Harlem, 
but made a deal with Johnson which allowed the numbers bankers who had fought for their independence to remain independent as long as their taxes were paid. The deal made Johnson an instant hero in the eyes of many Harlemites, who were impressed that a black man could actually cut deals with the Italian mafia. Although the deal wasn't perfect for Bumpy or Queenie, and not everyone was happy with it, at the same time, the people of Harlem realized that Bumpy ended the war without further losses and made an honorable alliance. After the talks, Johnson became the de facto head of Harlem, a man who stood up for his community and won. Besides, Stephanie St. Clair had to step away from the world of crime and slowly moved further and further away, and in the beginning of 1938, left entirely when she went to prison for shooting at her husband for cheating on her. Bumpy Johnson officially became the unanimous king of Harlem. The question that was now posed was, for how long can he hold on to power and keep competition at bay? With Bumpy Johnson as the godfather of Harlem, everything criminal that happened in the district had to get his blessing first. If someone wanted to do something in Harlem, however small or big it may be, he had to see Bumpy and ask him permission, as he was calling the shots. Controlling the majority of Harlem, he continued to foster relationships with the head of the Mafia, Lucky Luciano. It seemed impossible, but a black gangster and an Italian mafioso respected each other and often played chess with each other in public. Johnson was a true pro at chess, and even once said, if you master the game of chess, you master the game of life. Bumpy's partnership was also profitable for Luciano, as Harlem was finally at peace and order was established. There is always someone who isn't content with the status quo and tries to shake it up. One time, when Bumpy was having dinner with a glamorous editor of Vanity Fair, Helen Lawrenson, who he had an affair with, a shootout occurred outside. Johnson left his stake and joined in on the shooting, and once it was over, calmly returned to the table and was asked by the nervous, shaking Helen Lawrenson what happened. He replied without missing a beat. We both missed. Now I'm going to have a banana split. How about you? In another situation, Charlie, a New York pimp, attempted to rape one of the prostitutes that were under Bumpy's protection. In return, Johnson found the pimp and sliced him up with his favorite weapon, a razor blade. After the incident, Johnson took Charlie to the ER, where the bleeding pimp was moved to a stretcher. While being rolled away, he ratted on Bumpy and said that this was the work of the black-skinned gangster. Bumpy, who was standing beside him, flew into rage, jumping onto the stretcher and started clubbing Charlie's face. Police were quick on the scene and arrested the Harlem Kingpin. By the time Bumpy faced the judge in a trial pertaining to the incident in the hospital and the knife cuts, Charlie said he had no idea what the police were on about. Once recovered from his injuries, the pimp clearly came to his senses and didn't say anything against Bumpy in the trial. Another incident when someone went against Bumpy is perhaps the most famously documented incident where Johnson got aggressive to maintain order. As one chilling excerpt from Johnson's biography reads, Bumpy spotted Rollins. He pulled out a knife and jumped on Rollins, and the two men rolled around on the floor for a few moments before Bumpy stood up and straightened his tie. Rollins remained on the floor, his face and body badly gashed, and one of his eyeballs hanging from the socket by ligaments. Bumpy calmly stepped over the man, picked up a menu, and said he suddenly had a taste for spaghetti and meatballs. No wonder the assistant U.S. attorney described Bumpy as the most vicious and dangerous criminal in Harlem. Despite their gruesome nature, these acts were warranted. Harlem had never been so orderly in any of the past years, and despite his actions, he was more loved than feared. Even if Johnson was known as a violent gangster, he still portrayed himself as a man of the people, often helping his community. Some even compared him to Robin Hood because of the way he used his money and power to help the impoverished communities in his neighborhood. He delivered gifts and meals to his neighbors in Harlem, and even supplied turkey dinners on Thanksgiving and hosted a Christmas party every year. Bumpy also helped children from low-income families go to college and bought them clothes, and if someone delayed on their rent, he could have easily paid off the debt. Johnson would have never allowed men to murder women and small children. Bumpy almost always didn't ask for anything in return, other than the loyalty of the person whom he helped, hoping that when he may need help one day, it would be reciprocated. Thus, he became a complex, a double-sided coin, 
a murderous crime boss on one side and a philanthropic Robin Hood on the other. But Bumpy wouldn't be himself if he didn't end up back in prison, only this time for a long time. The residents of Harlem were hardly happy about the news. They were all worried about what would happen to the area now that the Godfather was behind bars. Bumpy Johnson's life in prison and on the outside was like a roller coaster. As soon as the gangster came out of prison, he would end up behind bars a couple of years later. This was Bumpy's schedule going back to when he first moved to Harlem and started doing criminal activity. As a rule of thumb, the godfather of Harlem would spend less and less time outside than in prison, and this time his sentence was substantial. Of course, controlling the enterprise from within bars was more challenging, but Johnson, like any other boss, had people on the outside and more importantly, still harbored the support of the Mafia and Lucky Luciano, who, just like before, had a good relationship with him. As soon as Bumpy got out of prison, he immediately got back to work, and this time, perhaps, was the peak of his criminal power in Harlem. In addition, Bumpy decided to take up the spiritual side of his life in addition to the criminal one. Johnson was known for his erudition and was nicknamed the Professor due to his love of books and philosophy. He also loved poetry and even wrote his own, some of which was finally published in Harlem magazines. Bumpy was almost always dressed to the nines, but now he arranged for custom-made suits to be sewn specifically for him and his ties to come from the elite haberdasher Sulka. Johnson was frequently surrounded by celebrities, but in recent years their numbers vastly increased. The godfather of Harlem tried to create an image that he lived like an influential white person with the idea that the police would, if only a little, relax their vigil. The next step was to create a family. Bumpy met the charming Mame Hatcher. Despite her being well informed of his violent criminal past, the couple married half a year after meeting each other and remained together until his death. Mame was nine years younger than the king of Harlem and it seems that Bumpy truly did love her. Johnson had connections, friends in high places, and a wonderful wife. He was free, and the cops didn't touch him, but it wasn't without a fly in the ointment. Bumpy had a grown daughter named Elise, who was an avid drug addict. The gangster never managed to build a relationship with her, but he was still her father. One day, Elise turned up with a random child, and Bumpy and his new wife took the child in. Margaret wouldn't have a chance with a junky mother, but living with her grandparents, she would have a normal childhood. The only caveat was that when Margaret grew up, Mame and Bumpy decided to hide the fact that they weren't her actual parents. Margaret lived for many years with full confidence that Bumpy was her father. Perhaps it was better for everyone this way. But who got his actual daughter hooked on heroin? Who flooded the streets of Harlem with drugs? Paradoxically, Bumpy Johnson played a crucial role in the distribution of narcotics throughout the suburbs. The Italian Mafia was one of the main conduits for drugs into America, all the way from the end of World War II to roughly the middle of the 60s. Together with the Italians, Bumpy flooded Harlem with heroin, although many claimed that Johnson wasn't directly involved with drugs and was just skimming his share. Harlem slowly started to drown in narcotics, and Bumpy and his Italian friends made decent money thanks to all the junkies. But no matter how much money there was to be made, jail sentences for the distribution of drugs was lengthy. Soon, Bumpy was caught once again. In 1952, during the peak of his rule, Johnson was arrested for the sale of heroin. Despite his claim that he was set up, and in this case, it probably being true, Johnson was sentenced to 15 years behind bars, most of which he would spend in the infamous Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary in California. This was the longest sentence of his life. Flash Walker, who basically got Bumpy in jail, was Johnson's personal chauffeur for many years. They had a cordial relationship and Bumpy trusted him. But when Walker got caught in a heroin deal, it left little room for friendship. The police gave him an ultimatum either to give up his boss or go to jail for a long time. Flash chose the first option, and Bumpy was the one that ended up going to prison for 15 years. However, Johnson didn't remain in debt for long, and after some time, the previous chauffeur disappeared without a trace. It is doubtful that he escaped. Most likely, he was caught and killed by Johnson's crew. Such a prolonged leave could have been the end of Bumpy's domination in Harlem. 
but Bumpy, already having a similar experience, was able to retain power. In 1962, the famous escape from Alcatraz took place, the first and the only in the entire history of this super-guarded prison. Three inmates escaped, and none of them were found. Many sources claim that Bumpy Johnson was crucial in helping them escape. Bumpy's men sent the escapees a boat and provided shelter where they could stay for a few days. So why didn't the godfather of Harlem escape with them? The answer is quite simple. Bumpy didn't want to be a fugitive, since if he was always hounded by the cops, he wouldn't have been able to conduct business in Harlem in his usual manner, not to mention he wouldn't be able to be seen in public. Besides, Johnson was a good inmate, spending his time quietly and peacefully, hoping to soon be released by being granted parole. This is exactly what happened, and only after a year, he left prison, aged 56. It is from this moment that perhaps the most reliable movie about Bumpy Johnson begins, or rather a TV series called Godfather of Harlem, starring Forrest Whitaker. Perhaps the show is full of inaccuracies, but to this day, it is the most truthful portrayal of the gangster in film. In the show, when Johnson returns to Harlem, he is greeted by his loyal wife and dozens of black Harlemites, who immediately ambush Johnson with petitions for help. In reality, things were a little different. His return was marked by a parade. People were truly happy that their godfather and mentor was finally free. They loved and respected him, and these emotions were genuine. They hoped that order would once again reign in Harlem after it degraded into a sad state during his absence. Bumpy saw it too. No parade could have overshadowed all the dullness and poverty that the streets now resembled. The area was flooded with drugs, city corners were full of needles, and junkies were loitering about looking for their next fix. It was a pitiful sight. Bumpy had a lot of work to do, and he immediately got to it. In hopes of rehabilitating the neighborhood and protecting its black citizens, politicians and civil rights leaders turned their attention to Harlem's drug problem. One of these people was Bumpy's old friend Malcolm X, who he knew all the way back from the 40s when Malcolm was still an ordinary street dealer. Now, Malcolm X was an African-American Islamic black rights activist who became universally known throughout the United States. It was with his help that Bumpy began his rehabilitation of Harlem. In return in 1964, the ex-dealer asked Johnson for protection against the leaders of the Nation of Islam, who at any moment could have attacked him. Everything was going well. Harlem was slowly getting rid of the drugs, but at the beginning of 1965, Malcolm X refused protection and cooperation from Bumpy. He decided that his connection with the known criminal would be bad for his image and asked Johnson to remove the security. Malcolm X paid a high price for his liberty with personal security and was assassinated only a couple of weeks later. Managing affairs in Harlem was becoming more and more difficult. The police were pressing harder and not letting up on Bumpy. It even got to the point that in December of 1965, Johnson staged a sit-in at the police station, refusing to leave, to protest their continued surveillance of him. He was charged with refusing to leave the police station, but the judge acquitted him. In 1968, the police charged Bumpy with conspiracy to distribute drugs. Johnson decided to run, but the police did not hesitate and chased after him. Soon after, the most influential gangster of Harlem was caught. The police believed that Johnson was trying to get on a flight to the Caribbean, thus trying to flee. Surprisingly, no drugs were found, and Bumpy was released on a $50,000 bail. The case never got to court, because suddenly, the godfather of Harlem, the man who brought the area back from its knees, died. Despite the numerous attempts on his life by all the various drug lords and mafia gangsters, it was cholesterol that finally got the most famous criminal authority in Harlem. Entering the expensive Wells restaurant on July 7, 1968, Bumpy ordered his favorite dish, fried chicken. He was surrounded by friends. Everyone was socializing, eating, and having fun. Suddenly, Johnson became ill. He fell and grasped at his chest. He lay in the arms of one of his closest friends, Junie Bird, as he breathed his last. He was 62 years old. Johnson's wife said that this was the best way to go for Bumpy. And it's true, he died almost instantly in a restaurant surrounded by friends while eating his favorite dish. Thousands of people came to Johnson's funeral, including dozens of policemen in uniform who stood on nearby rooftops with shotguns in hand. 
they must have thought that Bumpy would somehow resurrect, and so hell. In the years after Bumpy's death, he remained an iconic figure in Harlem history. But despite his massive influence and power, the godfather of Harlem has largely stayed out of the national public consciousness in ways that other infamous gangsters have not. Some believe that Johnson has been brushed off because he was a powerful black man ruling an entire neighborhood of New York City during the mid-20th century. However, in recent decades, Johnson's story has started to reach more people thanks to film and television. You may have noticed that throughout the whole story we have just told, we haven't mentioned Frank Lucas once. That's the very same gangster who's played by Denzel Washington in American Gangster. In that movie, Lucas continues Bumpy's work after Johnson's death and becomes one of the biggest drug lords in the country. But we had our reasons not to include him. The thing is that in truth, Lucas wasn't the person he's portrayed in film. In American Gangster, Lucas states that he had been Bumpy's driver for 15 years. The real Bumpy Johnson was in prison until 1963 and died in 1968, making that timeline impossible. In fact, Johnson's widow Mame Hatcher Johnson stated that Lucas was not present at her husband's death and was nothing more than someone who might have held Bumpy Johnson's coat for him, not the right-hand man that Lucas held himself up to be. The lies in that movie and in Lucas's story, where he was Bumpy's right-hand man, infuriated Mame so much, at the advanced age of 93, she decided to write a book about Johnson in which she told the real story. Regarding Frank Lucas, she poignantly remarked that he was nothing more than a lackey. Bumpy was an influential figure that held all of Harlem in his hands, and Lucas didn't play any significant part in it. Bumpy Johnson became a legend not only in Harlem, but in all of America. An ordinary black man could not have, at that time, become a significant figure in the criminal world of the United States, but Johnson managed to pull it off. He did much for Harlem and established order, but it's certainly impossible to say that Bumpy was a positive character. He was a gangster who was respected, and considering where he came from, achieved much. Bumpy Johnson was the first real influential black gangster, and for that, he will always be remembered.